Hi there, and I'm super excited that you guys have joined me today. My name is Angela Brown, and I'm the CEO of Hoarding World, also the CEO of Savvy Cleaner. For those of you that don't know, I've been a professional house cleaner for the last 25 years, uh, 25 years out in the field, and I've been training house cleaners and maids for the last 32 years. So I am super excited because today we're going to look at a different side of the cleaning business. We're going to look at the the personal side and joining me here today we have dr christine sauer and i'm super excited because she has a lot of experience that i don't have and i know over the last several weeks we've been asking lots of questions about ourselves to try to uncover some of the reasons why we feel stuck sometimes and we don't have the inspiration to maybe move forward with our lives we're hanging on to stuff from the past so I'm super excited about this conversation. I'm gonna invite you to jump in and ask your questions in the sidebar as well. And we'll go ahead and get started. With that, I would like to ask Dr. Christine to share just a little bit about how she came into this space because not everybody just ends up here organically, right? <laughs> so hello and welcome. Hi, Angela. Uh, so as I said, I'm Christine and I was born and raised in Germany. And uh, I became a physician, which was effortless for me. And uh, then after some time was working and being married and having two kids and cleaning the house, including cleaning the toilet, because cleaning is part of everyday life. And uh, um, I sank in a depression after an illness and started to clutter because I didn't have my profession anymore. I gave it up. I came to Canada mm. and... Uh, well, there was, of course, a lot that I couldn't take with me when I immigrated with my two teenage sons. But very soon, the stuff uh, amassed again. And I also am a mental clutterer, I would say. I tend to overload my brain with stuff until it comes out to the ears. <laughs> and I always say the brain holds on to the important stuff, but sometimes there's just too much overload. And then it's time to declutter also the brain. So I reinvented my life several times. In the last time, I became a brain health expert, which aligns wonderfully with my training. And uh, now I'm helping people with their mental health, with their brain health, and with also growing their wellness businesses, because it is not as easy as it is. You have to actually declutter a lot of things and let go of uh, self-limiting beliefs to make it in this hard world nowadays. Well, I know that you said you had gone from being a survivor to a thriver. And what, what exactly is that and what does that mean? That's a good question. Thank you, Angela. And what that means is when I was down at the dumps, was extremely depressed to the point that I was an inpatient in the mental hospital because I was so depressed, I wanted to commit suicide. And I was just surviving. And of course, they pumped me full with medications. And most of them cause you the inability to feel. So you're not really thriving. You are surviving. You don't feel. You just exist. So I was in this state for a while. I, I uh, actually met my current husband while I was, I call it now a little bit, uh, a zombie. That's how I felt. And he loved me as I was, which I credit him highly. He's a wonderful person. And uh, uh, at some point I made a decision and I said, I don't want to just exist. I don't want just to survive. That's not good enough. I want to live. I want to enjoy my life. I want to fulfill a meaning. I want to have a passion, a purpose. And since I wasn't a able to work as a physician anymore. I had a bad back and my license was expired and I had the qualifications, but honestly, they don't really want physicians in Canada, although they say so. Uh, they make it extremely hard for a foreign trained physician to practice. So that wasn't an option. So I had to reinvent myself and I invented myself as a coach. And it was harder than I thought, but over time, I reinvented myself and to be able to actually be strategic and rehabilitate my brain from that existing phase where I didn't really do much but exist on the Chesterfield and not do what I'm able to, I had to build up my own brain power to the point where now 
I'm pretty much back to my highest functioning or even more. And I can honestly say I thrive, or as I often call it, I sparkle because I enjoy my life. I'm happy. I'm healthy. Yes, I have bad days. Who doesn't? We just had here a severe wildfire in, in Nova Scotia. We were evacuated. Those were not my happiest days, honestly, when we were looking at the a satellite image of the wildfire, calculating how long it would take before our, before our house would burn up. Mm. And we need a lot of maids to clean up the mess that fire left behind. We were very fortunate and I'm very grateful. Our house is standing. It didn't get damaged. We are back home. But 200 people were not as fortunate and my heart goes out to them and everybody that's affected by a disaster, be it environmental, personal, because really when you are descending in the depth of a deep depression, it's a disaster. It's a personal disaster. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it takes a lot of vulnerability to admit that you went through a personal depression. And so if, if someone is going through a depression and they're fighting with the shame that comes along with that. I mean, obviously people don't want to tell their friends and their family, like, Hey, I'm suffering right now from, from a deep darkness that I'm going through. What, what symptoms would you say that people could look for that they would recognize that maybe they're in that state already. And they're, they're maybe even not recognizing that, that they're in that. You know, usually the person that is depressed, they know about it. They feel sad. They feel they don't have no initiative. They have no interest in doing the things that they used to do. They can't get out of bed in the morning. All they want to do is turn around in bed and push a snooze button and sleep another half hour. And uh, if your loved one uh, is there, is in that state and they just don't want to get up and it's not themselves, they're not lazy people, they're just don't think they're lazy. It's not lazy. Probably they're going through something. And a simple question is like, hey, you want to talk? Mm -hmm. Make all the difference. Because many people, and myself, I wasn't different. When they're going through that, what the ancient philosopher called the dark night of the soul, they think it's only them. It's me. Something's wrong with me. I'm defective. I'm a bad person. No. You're not alone. There's millions, millions, millions of people going through that. Not at this time. And it's something that can be overcome. Not always do you need medication. I personally prefer the non-medication approach whenever possible. And at least not long term, because it's often more harmful than helpful long term. There's better alternatives. So and if what we flip people, that... that if you, if we flip that script and you you are not the person that's recognizing the family member to be depressed, but maybe you are yourself the person that is depressed. Mm -hmm. If somebody is not asking you, do you want to talk and are you OK? How do you get out of your own shell to be able to ask for help if you are the person that is, in fact, suffering from the depression? You know, that can be very difficult, especially when you are a high achiever or work in a profession that you're not supposed to ask for help. And the physician is a classic example. You know, physician heal thyself, what crap. Uh, sorry to say that, but it's still expected. And I remember when I was 16 and my mother took me to my family doctor and the doctor said, oh, my knee, because he had arthritis in his knee. I thought, huh, a physician? It's impossible, he's a, he's a doctor. That's, that's, a, that's a, st a stereotype, it's just nonsense. Physicians have the same problem and physicians actually are one of the professions with the highest suicide rates. And I think one of the reasons is that they don't have the courage to ask for help. And I say courage on purpose because at the beginning I thought it's a weakness. Mm. And that fear, oh my God, I can't ask for help, that's so beneath me. I shouldn't have to ask for help. I have to deal with that myself. And you just try to deal with it. And at some point it just doesn't work because emotional pain hurts just as bad as physical pain, right? So what do you do if you are a high achiever? Because you just mentioned that the physicians are inside that category of high achievers and expected to, I'm guessing, be the support system for everyone else. 
And so what happens when you yourself cave in and you're like, ah, I just don't have it to give right now. How, how, what, what are your next steps and, and how do you cope? I think many people try to cope with it with the vacation. And there's healthier ways to cope and exercise vacation, taking a rest, a break, or really reflecting, journaling. Those are all healthy and helpful strategies that are often help. And there's good books, by the way, that help, like by David Burns. I studied under him now, like feeling good, feeling mm -hmm. great. Those are excellent books that come with workbooks and they are very helpful. Uh, and, and often it's all what you need if it's not too bad. Now then there's unhelpful strategies and some people, they start drinking, mm -hmm. they start taking drugs. Uh, marijuana is a common now because it helps with anxiety. It depresses the brain. It makes you not feel. So in that sense, it's a psychopharmacological drug. It is a drug. All uh, mind altering drugs are similar to psychiatric drugs. Not much difference chemically. And so if you are in that state of depression and you are knowing that, hey, I need I need some help and you're recognizing that you are, in fact, depressed, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned journaling. What what is the process of journaling if you were going to do something like that? Because that might be a first good step just to, to maybe just get your thoughts on paper so that you would know what to ask if you were going to ask for help and then maybe even pursue some other opportunities that might be available to you. But I think getting it out on paper would be good. But what, how would you start that process if you've never journaled before? Yeah, and that is, that is quite an interesting point. And I mean, most people that are depressed and they take a piece of paper, they just want to write down how they feel. I uh -huh. feel so miserable. This happened and I think I'm the worst person ever. And when you read that back to yourself, sometimes you say to yourself, what? That's such crap. But why do I think that? <laughs> and often you can think like that in that moment. And I also want to say, if it's so bad, yet you're uh, seriously thinking of hurting yourself, please reach out to a professional. If you need to go to the emergency room, there is help. And uh, it's important to do that because it's sad when especially young people die by their own hand, just because they didn't get the help they needed early enough. And especially in the short term, even a stay in the mental hospital is not the end of the world. I was there. I know how it is. It's not the end of the world. It can be actually a relief because it takes you out of your situation and you finally get to relax because everything is done for you. You don't have to stress out over where's the next meal coming from. Do I have to shower? What, what happens? No, it doesn't matter. Nurses are looking after you. And, and that, that can be a big relief for, for, for a certain time and very helpful. If it's not that bad, and, and please do that. And there's numbers you can call. I'm not a big fan because those help numbers I've <laughs> I've heard from people that eventually ended up to me. They called those help numbers and it said, it was a suicide line and it said, uh, um, please wait, your call is important to us. Uh, that is discouraging if you are suicidal and uh, shouldn't happen, but it does because those numbers are understaffed too. So then it may be better to actually get in your car, drive yourself to the emergency room. That's what I did eventually. I nearly crashed my car, but before I did it, a little inner voice told me, you don't want to die, you need help. Mm -hmm. I drove myself to the emergency room. It was, was the best decision I ever made from my current standpoint. It was over 25 years ago. And if you are now in that dark place, believe it, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, even though you're stuck in the dark part and you can't see the light yet. I sometimes compared, you know, I'm coming from Europe, there's the mountains. Mountains have large tunnels mm -hmm. and those tunnels can be miles long. And at the end of the tunnel is a little bend and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel until you're nearly at the end. And it's the same with depression. You go through a dark stretch. You said, is it never going to end? And then your life takes a little turn. And that's like in a southern tunnel. You, uh, it opens up and the bright sun shines again. And that will happen with your life too. And that is my image that I always give those people that struggle with depression. I said, yes, you are in the dark. You are in the tunnel. But you watch. There will be the turn and the bright southern sign, sun will shine again. 
And I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, one of the first things that we request people do when they are going through a, a very difficult time is that they open the windows in their house, that they open the blinds because it's easy to close the blinds and stay closed in and to just keep mm -hmm. the room dark. Like you said, you want to roll over and go back to sleep, which in order to make that conducive, we close the blinds and we try to make it dark and nice and peaceful. But in order to reverse the process and to get up and to become active again, one of the first things re we request is that they open the windows, open the blinds and let some sunlight in so that it does affect your attitude in your mind and your serotonin levels and all the things that <laughs> the sunlight is good for. And so I love the fact that you brought that up. And and you probably deal with people that are housebound and actually don't want to go out anymore. And that is really sad because I always say nature's the great healer. Mm -hmm. And just going in your garden and barefoot on the lawn if there's no too much clutter. <laughs> well, um, it's, it's we're, really we're we're hoping that one of the first things people will do is they're as they're figuring out what the next steps are, that they will put on a pair of walking shoes and they will get out and go for a brisk walk because yeah. we know that the lymphatic system is generated by momentum and energy, like activity. And so if we can get our blood circulating and the oxygen flowing through our body again, sometimes it's enough that it will clear our thoughts just enough that we can then get to the next phase, which is maybe asking for help or like you said, getting in the car and getting, you know, driving safely to the emergency room where you can get extra help. And so we're, we're looking for those little tiny micro movements that will get us from point A to point B without doing anything drastic. And I love the fact that you were so vulnerable to share with us, it's okay to get in your car and drive to the emergency room. That's okay. And we, we would request that you do look for help if you're in a state where you're, you're feeling so trapped or so paralyzed that you can't respond. If you're, if you're in a place where you can't do that, I love the fact that you gave us permission to get in the car and to go for that drive. And you said absolutely. you almost. Yeah, absolutely do that. And you know, I, I just, you said about the micro commitments or the micro actions. I love that because I always say to my clients when they don't get this stuff done, uh, what do you do when you get a little bit done? Oh, I just do the next thing. Wrong approach. Because the real power is in celebrating the little things. Mm -hmm. And I wrote uh, actually a nice blog post. It's on my website, how to appreciate the little things. It still ranks on Google uh, because it's really helpful. It shows you that it's important to appreciate the little things. You notice when you go outside, you see a little flower. Look at it. Celebrate God's love for nature. Celebrate nature and then celebrate yourself and say, hey, I made it outside. I'm the greatest. Power move. There you go. And in celebrating the small things, I want to stop for just a second and I want to say hi to the folks that have joined us today. We've got Fran Thompson here from Arizona. Hi, Fran. It's super good to see you again. We've got Priscilla here and she says, thanks. Thank you. Such valuable information. Um, we have Priscilla here again and we have Melanie. Melanie says, greetings and salutations, everyone. Don't forget to hit the like button. Yes. Thank you, Melanie, for giving us the thumbs up. We've got Judy here. Judy's joined us multiple times. Hey, Judy, it's good to see you. Um, we just have a really great turnout here today. Thanks, guys, for joining us. We've got Carolyn here. And uh, we do have a question. Um, and this one is from Priscilla. She says, TBI and severe PTSD. I'm in this position now. Thank you for sharing your story. I want to highlight this because there are many people that are joining us today. And it takes a lot of courage, Priscilla. Thank you so much for sharing with us that you're going through this yourself because it brings to the front that it's okay to have these conversations. And that's what we're doing here today is we're making it safe to have these conversations because if we don't talk about this and we keep forcing it out into the, the private parts of our life where we're, we're ashamed and we're scared to talk about it, we're not going to get the answers we're looking for. So I love the fact that Dr. Christine joined us today and has some information for us because just the, the tiny things that she suggested so far from the journaling to making it safe to give the help, get the help that you need, going to the hospital if you need to go and asking for help, or if you are a family member and someone's at your house and they are acting or seeming depressed, to ask them, do you wanna talk? It's a simple thing and it's absolutely free. But if you see someone in your house that's suffering with 
a dark moment or a series of dark moments or a, a physical change in their life, it's okay to stop and ask for help. I know that there are ebbs and flows of everybody's life. And there are moments when you might have a dark moment and there might be a time when genetically you might have a hard moment, like you're going through menopause or something. And all of a sudden your, your hormones are just wackadoodle and you, you find yourself in a situation that you've never been in before. And that, that might look like depression. I know for me, I had a really difficult time and my husband reached out and he's like, you need, you need me. I was like, oh man, I need you more than ever. And if you talk to me, I'm going to like, Bree! you know, <laughs> but he was so patient and so kind and so understanding because for me, I was, I was going through this, you know, really weird change and I needed help. Yeah. And, and I love that you mentioned your husband, Angela, because any support person that is supportive in a sense that they don't criticize you, they don't belittle you, they don't say, oh, that's going to go and just wish it aside. That is very helpful. When they just sit down with you, maybe put an arm around you and it doesn't have to be a husband, can be a good friend, can even be a mentor, a teacher or somebody in your neighborhood that you trust. It's important to pick those people. And sometimes if you don't have somebody in your neighborhood, yes, a professional person is better than a stranger that may criticize you or make it worse or say, oh, well, you're depressed. What the heck? Or just jump off the bridge. So what? The world is overpopulated anyway. You hear all those people. It's ridiculous. Uh, and, 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 and as a depressed person, you really need somebody to care for you, to show you that there's love in this world, even when you as a person feel totally unlovable. And, you know, when I was in my darkest moment, I didn't love myself. And, you know, I met people in the hospital that cared more about me at this point than I cared for myself. Wow. What's that? That. Uh, looking back it's amazing and now i'm trying to be that person for others and i love how you came full circle with that where you went through that experience as difficult as that was and you realized what a difference those people made in that dark moment and then you turned around and you became that person for other people you know one of my sayings is never give up never ever there's always an, uh, an alternative there's always another solution. Just keep looking. If the first person is not right, ask again, ask another. Yes, it takes courage. It takes persistence. My husband calls it stubborn. I call it tenacious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be persistent. You have to repeat, repeat. It's the same when you want to heal from depression. Yes, pills are relatively easy to take and for some it is a good solution. On the long run, for most people, they want to experience a personal growth, the personal growth that results from going through hard times. And we've seen that from literature. We've seen that from many, many people before us that have gone through the same things. And now in the times of the Internet, they are all over the place. Many of them are coaches, by the way, mm -hmm. because many of people that went through hard times and reinvented their lives. They feel so passionate about sharing what they learned. And, and I love that because it's so important that we as the older generation, I call myself, I, I just I turn 62 next week. And I feel the responsibility for me to share my knowledge, my experiences with the younger generation. I'm not saying, oh, I'm old. What do I care about? No, it's a responsibility. And yes, I have two kids. They are 42, 41. I have eight grandkids. They're not local. But everyone, many people have kids or grandkids. And if it's not your own, it's adopt somebody else's in your mind. And, you know, one of the best strategies, once you're no longer down in the hole yourself, to feel better is to get outside of yourself and look for something you can do to make other people's lives better, whatever that is for you. So I'm curious, if you hadn't gone through the depression yourself, do you think that you would be the person you are today and being the coach and the doctor that you are helping other people had you not gone through that? I don't think. I really believe in, if I hadn't gone through that, I would still be in Germany, probably practice, being a general practitioner, pretty good probably. I was was not bad. I knew a lot and I helped a lot of people. But that depth of understanding, uh, the, the, that care and my, my love and my 
people tell me my energy has increased and I call it the sparkle in your eyes that, that you can only get when you really went through something and then came out the other side. And I started to create um, books and, and, and movies. Uh, one of my favorites is the seven steps to climb the mountain of life. Where I translated that in a little bit of poetic way, uh, way what, what I experience and what I see other people also go through in those steps that we all do to climb the mountain of life or this uphill spiral of personal growth. And, you know, when you look at philosophy, the mm. ancient philosopher, the Bible, whatever faith tradition you belong to, they all say the same thing. And Jesus had to go 40 days in the desert for those who are Christians. And he came out a changed person because he went through hardships. And, and I, I think that's really important when you when you bring up the hardships because they they refine us, if you will, and they make us the people that we that we are. Yeah. In fact, in my own personal life, I look at it as like riding uphill on a bicycle. Sometimes we're really struggling. And when you ride uphill on a bicycle, you're not just sitting there cruising along. You kind of like get up off your seat and you struggle really hard with your legs and you're just really, you know, your body movement is different and you're giving it everything you have. Then as you crest the top of the hill, now you can glide back down the next hill. But if you, as you go down the next hill, instead of just coasting, if you'll start pedaling right at the bottom, that will give you enough momentum to get back up the next hill. And I think our life is in ebbs and flows, almost like riding up and downhill on a bicycle. And so when I feel like I'm in a really tough rut and I'm just really climbing, I feel like, oh, I'm climbing, which means I'm about to crest the top of the hill. So if I just keep going a little bit longer, there's going to be a downhill and I can kind of catch my breath before I, I, I go up the next hill, right? I'm going to be able to catch my breath and kind of glide and then boo, we'll go again. But I feel like the next hill, I'm better because I went through the last hill. I feel like I'm stronger now and I have a new set of skills and I feel like I can do better on the next challenge, whatever that is in life, because of what I just came through. I Is love that? that analogy, Angela. I really do. I sometimes compare it with a dark hole, you know. Life throws you in a dark hole because you get a sickness. You have a loss. Somebody dies, a pet, an, an animal. You have a severe illness, an accident, and something happens, and you end up in that big, dark hole. And the first time you are there, you look around, you don't know what to do. And you're helpless and somebody else reaches down hopefully and helps you and pulls you out that's what happens in a mental hospital that's what happened to me and then life comes again throws you in the black hole but this time you look around and you said okay i got out the first time what can i do and you look and and scratch at the walls and you start making a beginning but you're not really strong enough so you you slowly reach up and somebody reaches down and helps you out Mm -hmm. And then the next time, because life throws you in the hole again, that's life. It always throws you in dark holes. Next but time is it fair to say, is it fair to say that when you go in the hole, it's never as bad as it was before? And I say this because we went through this global pandemic here a couple of years ago. And in the beginning, the whole world was like, oh, no, there's this huge pandemic. And we watched the news and there were people in all these hazmat suits and they're walking around with fogging machines. And it seemed like so disastrous. Everyone was wearing the face masks. And, you know, we were so scared to, like, come out of our houses because. But I think today, because that was a dark hole for everyone. But I think today, if there were another global pandemic, if there was one. I don't think it would be as scary because I think we've already been through that. We are stronger. We are better. We are smarter than we were before. And so I think going into it again, if it were to happen today, we'd go, oh, yeah, OK, here we go again. We've been through this before. We don't need to you know, terrorize the stores with buying all the stuff off the shelves because there will be more. And maybe it's not as dramatic as we thought it was. Like, we're going to survive this. We're going to pull through, right? I think we get stronger every time. And I think our information stacks on top of each other. When even if we're in a really dark hole, we're like, hey, wait a second. We got this. You know, we've been through this before. We're going we're gonna to survive okay, right? You know how I go on usually with the hole? I say you look around and then you see there's wooden sticks in there. So you learn to build a ladder. 
and eventually you climb out yourself and then after a while you learn to make how to make your own pogo stick and then when life throws you in the hole you just climb on your stick and push you back out so i love that faster and that's exactly how i see it the first time you land in a deep toe of depression it lasts long it can last mm -hmm. a year if you don't get help fast mm -hmm. enough the right one and when it happens again when i have a bad day it's a bad day it does not become a series of weeks or months because I have that little pogo stick and those are the tools, the tools that you can acquire for your mental health and brain health toolbox that allow you to jump out of black holes that life throws you in relatively fast, be it a pandemic or personal disaster or wildfire. I'm so sorry about the wildfires. I didn't, you mentioned that before and I didn't say anything about that. And I'm so sad because I mean, right now it, it's sweeping across the country right now is this dense fog. It's closed airports down and everything. And there's so many people that are, um, ex, uh, they're, they're a part of it. They're, they're experiencing parts of it right now. And so I'm really sad for all the people that are going through that. And I hope that if there's anybody that's watching this or that is affected by that, you know, God bless you. And I hope everything is okay. Yeah. I do want to um, draw attention to uh, Dominique has a question here. She says, I feel energetic, inspired and joyful when helping out with others and doing things, uh, doing the things should be doing at my place, but met with with overwhelming returning home. My sense of logic fails to understand why I cannot get myself to ta tackle essentially simple and equally rewarding tasks at home, still grieving a two decade old divorce but not considering myself a victim by any means. What advice or suggestions would you give to Dominique in this particular situation? You know, Dominique, uh, what I'm hearing, and let me know if it's not right, is that you gain your energy from helping others. It's a typical helper syndrome, we call that. It's a helpless helpers. I had it myself when I was a physician. When I lost the ability to help others, I got depressed because I, I got my self-love from others. I, I loved helping others and seeing their eyes love me back. I wanted their attention, their appreciation. I needed it. Now, I still appreciate it. I don't necessarily need it. Mm -hmm. I need love. I need care. But at some point, it's important to start recognizing and caring for what I call your inner golden uh, chest that nobody ever can steal from you. And that's your deep inner self. And you can learn to open that up to the divine energy, whatever you think it is, and then gain the energy that is there in your own universe and let it stream it into your inner being and fill you up with so much love that you then, uh, you know, that image with the cup that's half full or half empty, when that cup is filled yourself, you can serve others from the overflow without burnout, without losing your own energy when you come home. I, think oh, I that love that. So, and and I, I haven't seen anybody that I coach that hasn't been able to do that over time. It takes time sometimes to see, oh, wow, I, I'm worthy. I'm, I'm not that miserable human being that I thought I was. And often we treat ourselves worse than everybody else. And sometimes I ask, when, when a client says something, I said, what do you say to yourself? And they tell me. And then I say to them, would you say the same thing to your best friend? And 99% the answer, no, of course not. Because I have told myself too, I'm an idiot. I would never say that to my best friend. I love her. <laughs> so why did I say that to myself? Don't I love myself? I didn't. Now I do. Well, I think one of the hardest things is to give yourself permission to love yourself. And I'm so glad that you just did that because we, we have to live with ourselves forever. Right. I remember when the night that I moved away from home and I got a contract in North Carolina, I was leaving Utah and my dad came out to the driveway. And as as I was leaving, I said goodbye to him. And he said, I want you to remember one thing. He said, when you leave, he said, you don't have to live with the people. I was going to live with another family. I was going to go be a nanny. He said, you don't have to live with that family forever, but you do have to live with yourself. 
He said, become the kind of person that you want to live with 365 days a year, every year for the rest of your life. And I was like, whoa, that was some interesting parting words, dad. <laughs> and then I thought about that a lot. And I was like, yeah, that's so true because I do have to live with myself. I have to become the person that I want to live with. And if I'm not happy with that person, and if I'm feeling sad or sorry or depressed or in a dark hole or whatever, whatever the, the options are, I love the strategies that you've given us today to recognize the fact that I am worthy and I do deserve a life of health and happiness. And in order to do that, I get to take control of asking for help or driving myself to the doctor to get the help that I need or to do the journaling or some of the, the different steps along the way that are going to either make me feel better or clear my thoughts and put me in a state of mind where I can then get the help that I need, whatever that looks like. Because I know there are all different types of help that are oh, out there, but sometimes we're blind to them because we're, we're either not in the right zone or we're just not aware. I know that sometimes when I go on, uh, I, I went on YouTube the other night and I stumbled into a piece of software that's been around forever, but I never knew it existed. It didn't exist for me because I didn't know about it. And as soon as I discovered it, I was like, oh, why are we not using that in our business? And it, it immediately it like opened up a whole world for me, right? But just like that software, there's there are a bunch of different opportunities that we could partake of that maybe we just we, we just don't even know they exist. So I, I love that you've you brought know, those to our attention. I, I, I today. like that to compare that actually like that because I always compare the brain with my cell phone uh, because it makes clients understand how our brain works. You know, we have the hardware, which is the physical part of the brain, the neurotransmitter, the food goes in, and uh, exercise helps the physical aspect. But then we have the software, you know, Android, iPhone, the software makes the programs run, and we have a software in the brain, we call that the thoughts, the emotions. But then the cell phone to work, so you can watch your YouTube video, uh, make it work. You need another dimension that many people forget in these times, and I think it's just as important. And for the phone, you might have guessed it, you have to connect it to the Wi-Fi. And how does Wi-Fi work? It needs somewhere the internet. And the internet is something that we know is there because we see the effects, <laughs> but we cannot see it. It's, it's around me. You cannot see it, right? But it's there. And it's the same with our brain. We need that connection to a spirit spiritual source to a spiritual energy whatever you believe it is and over 80 percent of the people believe there's a god of some kind but most people when they get older especially when they went through depression they learn to connect with that spiritual source for me it's synonym with love real love what the egypt what the old greek called agape you know and you can connect with that eternal love with that universal love and how Harness it and connect with it, whatever you want to call it, and draw it in your inner being, that inner golden chest that's yours and yours alone, and draw in God's love and connect it to you and fill your cup with love to the brim, to the overflow. It's all there. We don't have to just get it from others. Yes, we are social beings. We are made to be connected with others, but we are not made to need others. And from literature, you know, there have been people in history that lived for years as hermits in the woods by themselves. But now they were not alone. You're never alone. There's always some kind of an energy around. That's the connection, I think, that we need to function, just like our cell phone. Because, you know, when it runs out of power, the Internet goes out, it's dead, we say. Well, how is it with people? We are dead, too, when our power runs out. The physical power, the mental power. Or the spiritual power they all can run out so i'm curious if you have not and let's just say for example that someone has never pursued a spiritual path and they have been trying to go out life alone and they feel frustrated because either as a type a personality that just goes and goes and goes or maybe somebody that hasn't experienced a lot of achievement and then is feeling like you know what is my life worth and what what have i done here while i've been on earth how would you recommend a person start going from not being spiritual at all to try to find that divine light that you said you could take in and let that be enough inside your soul where would you start that process 
This is a very difficult question. And it took for me, I think, about 15 years in going through the depth of depression to actually learn that there is more than nothing. <laughs> I was an atheist until I was 38 years old. And I believed, no, no, there's no God. It's impossible. Science proves otherwise. And then at some point, I realized science doesn't know everything. Mm. And uh, there's more to life than we know. And when you look back in history, I studied extensively history. In the 12th century, we thought, honestly, the Earth is flat. That was science of the day. So we don't know what uh, future science will say about that person. But I think there's some kind of energy out there that we don't know what it is, and we chose to call it God. Now, if you show an airplane to somebody that lived 500 years ago, they would say, oh, my God, God is flying. <laughs> <laughs> if you would come out of an airplane, 500,000 years ago, they would think you're the gods, no question. So it's relative, really, what we call God, what we call spiritual. But I think when you get older, most people, especially when they get to, through hardships, discover that there's something that maybe they want to explore. And a good path to explore is, is to connect with the tradition. If you grew up in one, if it's not very negatively connected, which is sometimes is, and explore it. I did to study it, uh, different faiths. I wanted to see what's really the root. And I, was, I stumbled across mysticism in Christianity, mysticism in, uh, in Islam, Sufis, mysticism in Judaism. I found that very interesting. <laughs> there's mysticism in all religions. And of course, there's a the Chinese with the Taoism. There's a, the, uh, the Indians with their different uh, spiritual phase and they are all fascinating and the older phase all have the same basis when you distill it down and and I love every one of them and they all have their validity I think and it's up to you individual what's right for you and if you're not in that stage you don't want it fine not everybody needs it I spoke a lot with dying people and it's interesting Hardly anybody dies an atheist. But on the other hand, there's two types of people that die the easiest. One person is absolutely convinced atheist, and the one the other people are the ones that are connected with the faith. The people that have the hardest time is they don't know. Mm. Because for them, death is a big unknown, and they're scared. That's interesting because I never thought about the life's last moments when you said people don't die, they don't die unknowing. <laughs> I I know for me personally, as I started studying faiths, because I did too, I studied a whole bunch of different religions looking for the right uh, place for myself. And one of the things that I found that was a cohesive match with a lot of the different philosophies and religions that are out there were some basics. And I like basics. I like fundamentals because they don't lie. And yeah. so, for example, a fundamental of a house is I go into a house and what? There's a front door. On every house, there's a front door. You walk in, there's an entryway. In every home, there's an entryway. And then there are common rooms in every home, like a kitchen and a bathroom and bedrooms. Those are common rooms in every house. The homes will look different, but the homes will have the same, the same basics. So for religion, it was the same to me in that there were some basic common things with all the different religions and philosophies that I found. And there were things like love and compassion and understanding. And I was like, hey, wait a second, these I can grab onto. Yeah. And so if I was going to implement in my life without knowing, because at the time I did not know exactly what I believed and I was searching, but yeah. in the process of searching these things I can believe in, which are the compassion and the understanding and the unconditional love acceptance yeah. of other people as they are right now. And as I started looking at those things, I would say to myself, how do I how do I implement this today? How do I use this today in my own personal life? Like today, I know about unconditional love. What does that look like for me today? If I was going to go practice unconditional love today, and then you have to ask, ask the question, if you're not going anywhere, who are you going to practice that on? Yeah. You get to practice that on yourself if you're only staying at home today, right? You get to practice that on yourself. And I love that. It. that is, that's wonderfully said. I, I really enjoy that because it's so true. All we have is this moment here. What can we do right now to make our life and 
if we have any that we love and care about and that of others better that's all we can do mm -hmm. is that it, it's in a way it's liberating because we don't have to be complicated and planning for the future 15 years ahead what we want to do on the 15th of july 2052 if he's still alive no we don't <laughs> have to it's just today and yes it makes sense to plan a little bit ahead but not everything my mother was an extreme planner she wanted everything planned when we went on vacation we knew beforehand every minute where we went it was horrible <laughs> you have to relax a little bit sometimes on the other hand, you don't want to leave everything to luck or chance because then everything doesn't work in our modern world, especially. And even earlier in, in history, people had to plan for the winter if they lived in those. People had to plan where to get the food for the next day. So I think there has to be a balance. And in the end, life is about balance. I think the balance, though, is what you you are experiencing and showing us today. You're leading by example. You went through a dark place in your life. You spent your entire life learning and educating yourself. And because of the planning and the preparations that you did, that makes you prepared today to show up and to answer our questions today. And so you're not winging it and you're not just flying by the seat of your pants, but you're bringing a whole lifetime of experience and wisdom to this exact moment. And I love that because here in this moment, we're experiencing your greatness because you're leading by example. Well, thank you. That's so gracious of you. And, you know, uh, I love to speak about death and dying because the, as the Latin people always said, memento mori, remember that you will die because it will help you to live in the now. And sometimes people, when I tell them, you know, if I died right now in front of you, it wouldn't bad, it wouldn't bother me. It would, it would, I would feel sad for you because it's maybe a shock for you if somebody dies in front of you. It wouldn't matter to me if I die tomorrow. My husband is the same way, and I think it's important to think about how we want to die and what do we want to do in the days and times that we have left before we die. Because right now I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And right now, I want to make a positive difference for someone that's listening. I, that's I love that. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I was talking to my mother not too long ago and my mother and I were having a conversation about death. And it was because we were wanting to know, does she have all of her affairs in order? And does she have, you know, end of life wishes? And what are her what are her requirements for how she's expecting things to go? But we were talking about life and death. And the conversation led us to what was really important was how we were living our life while we still had life left. Mm -hmm. And I, I also came to the realization that if today were my last day, I would leave with no regrets. And I told mm -hmm. that to my mother. I said, I showed up every single day and I gave every single day everything I had. There was nothing left to give. I gave everything I had. And I lived, I lived my life to its very fullest. And so if I get to live to tomorrow, I'm going to give myself a high five because yay, I made it another day. It's a bonus. <laughs> yeah. And if I live 10 more years, yay, you know, in a hundred years, yay. But if today was my last day, I would leave this earth with no regrets because I showed up every day and I gave it everything I had. And I think it's important. Like you said today, I think this is really important. And if this is my takeaway from my time with you today, this is it. During those really dark moments, are you still giving it your very best? Are you are you welcoming this moment? And are you are you looking for solutions? Are you looking for answers? Are you trying are you trying to 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 still live life to your very best? Because if you give yourself permission, like, hey, maybe I'm in a slump right now, and this is the best I have to give. If that's the best you have to give, you know, yay, you gave it your very best. You did not give up. You went ahead and you saw answers in spite of the fact that maybe you felt like, you know, crap or whatever, and you wanted to go back to sleep or whatever. But if you kept trying, yay, you know what I mean? Yay. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's very interesting from a brain science standpoint out what you just said, because it is so true. Because when we are down in the dark and we do one little thing, just say we put take, pick up a, a piece of dirty laundry, put it in the washing machine. It, the most important thing to do after we did that is to reward ourselves and celebrate because mm -hmm. that tells the brain, hey, that's something I like. The brain likes to celebrate. I sometimes get up on Zoom with my clients and we do a victory dance over some little thing like picking up a sock. Hey, it doesn't matter. 
it's a victory at that moment for you and it's worth celebrating. Just that little suck is worth celebrating. And your brain registers and the good feel good hormones, the dopamine, the serotonin gets in the brain going and it tells itself, hey, I want more of this. And what do you do? Next time you go around and you see a sock or something, you, you pick up another sock and then you celebrate again. Don't forget to celebrate. And over time, that becomes a habit. When you celebrate every little thing, your life becomes a celebration. So I, I, have to, I have to share this with you. Um, in my house, because of uh, celebration often turns to eating sugary treats. And that's a no-no in my house. <laughs> so to celebrate, we have these little tiny happy bones. It's got a, I, I figure if the worst thing that happens to you is you look up from your desk and there's a little happy face looking at you, you know, every it time there's a smile. success. Every time there's a success in our house, we ring the little happy bell. And then what's really cool is I have them in all these different colors and they're all around the house. They're all around the house. And so like when you make the bed in the morning, you ring the little bell. So I can hear the bell in the morning and I, I'm like, oh, my husband just made the bell. So I have a bell near me. So he rings the happy bell. I ring the happy bell in here. It's like, yay, yay. Okay, cool. Doesn't cost anything. Well, after the bell, it doesn't cost anything because we now own them. But uh, no sugar is involved, which I'm I'm happy about. They're honest to goodness dopamine highs. Okay, yeah. so what's really cool is all my employees. I have one at everybody's desk, and every time they accomplish something, like they finish a task of some sort, they ring the bell, and then everybody else rings their little bells in unison, like "Yay, we're cheering for you!" So it's this cool little reward, like you like you mentioned, and it's audible, and I love the audible fact because it rings throughout the house. And so like my husband yeah. will get on the scale in the morning and if he's lost a pound, he rings the bell because there's a little bell in the bathroom. Like I said, I've got them scattered all over the house. You guys are going to think I'm crazy, but yeah. I got to tell you how much it works. Like yeah. I hear one from the kitchen and I'm like, one came from the kitchen. What is that? And my husband, you know, I ring the bell and my husband's like, I just did the dishes. And I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, Angela, those little things, they seem silly, but it's applied neuroscience. <laughs> It's 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 changed so all, our all world. The science, all the science that is in the books is futile if it's not applied in practical everyday life for people, for the benefit of people, not to the harm of people. And those bells, they're a classic example. Come on, that's awesome. Let's well, ring the bells, people. That's bells right. people ring the bell. Well, and then and you, we, we make we sell ourselves to happiness. There we go. It's, it's a simple thing. And like I said, it's inexpensive. Once you own the bells, you own them for life, but we've got yeah. a lot of use out of them. But that brings me to the gratitude journal. And I know today you've made available to the members that are listening here to us today, your gratitude journal. Tell us about that. You know, as a brain scientist, I stumbled off course about gratitude and gratitude balances the brain. It actually does. And Dr. Eamon, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Daniel Eamon, you might know his book, Change Your Life, Change Your Brain. Uh, no, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, sorry. And he did neuroscience studies and spec scans, uh, neuro, uh, brain scans of people that were fearful and that were grateful. And the grateful brain looked great. The fearful brain didn't. So gratitude is a very important thing. And it's not a skill. It's not a task. I had a client, oh, I have to do that to the, in the morning then, my three things of gratitude. No, I said, it's not something you add to your to-do list. Gratitude is an attitude that once you learn it, you carry it with you. And every single moment, you can find something to be grateful for. Right now, check yourself. What are you grateful for? And I asked that my clients, they have a hard time. And I said, look at yourself. Do you have five fingers? Yeah. Here, yeah, something to be grateful for. Not everybody has five fingers. I do. Wow, five fingers. I'm so grateful for it. I can see. I have eyes to see. Wow. I'm grateful right now for my eyes. I have glasses that make me help to read. I'm grateful for my glasses. I can smell when I have something on the stove cooking and it burns. I can smell it before the house burns down. I'm grateful. I have a nose that smells. All the little things around you, 
I'm grateful for the computer right now, for the electricity that powers the computer, for the internet that makes it possible for us to have the show and to share that with others that are far away because the world is a small place thanks to electronics. That's a positive side. I'm grateful for that. And I'm, I do exercises with my clients. I have them give them a task, homework, write down 100 things that you're grateful for, 100 things you appreciate. Often they get stuck after five at the most. <laughs> and what they appreciate on themselves. Yeah, I finished high school. I had an university. That's a big, big rocks. But all the little things that happen every day, it's important to notice them. And sometimes that's something, an learned, acquired skill that you actually look around you and say, hey, I have a pen here. That's a useful tool and I'm grateful and appreciate that pen right now. Makes me feel good. Hey, I have a pen. Let's celebrate a pen. Isn't that awesome? Yay! <laughs> and Joseph McLennan, he said, get out, get out of your physically. Sorry, the camera doesn't show it well, but get physically up when you do your victory dance. The brain perceives it differently and you get a much higher dopamine serotonin jolt if you do that. If you actually move your body to a physical victory dance, if you can put your favorite music on, if you have a big venue, like you cleaned up a whole room. Wow, what an achievement. <sighs> so where, where can our listeners go to get your, um, your gratitude journal? Well, the easiest place is to go to my website, drchristine.com. And uh, you can click on uh, stress and relief and uh, opt in at any time or there slash gratitude dash journal and you get it for free as a PDF. And of course, it's on Amazon and uh, there is a link. Perfect. You can get it for free. And if you like it, you can get it on Amazon. So you can actually physically write in it because I have quotes in it, not by me, by smarter people than me. And I have questions in it that help you think. And one of my clients said, this is different than other gratitude journals. It makes me think. <laughs> That's one of the things I love to do. When a client said, wow, I never thought about it that way. That's my one of my biggest rewards. Well, I love the fact that you've made this available to us today for this reason. When you are in a state of gratitude, it's very hard to be in a state of nagging and judgment at the same time. They're, they're opposite sides of the spectrum. It's like the pendulum swung from one side all the way over to the other. And when you're coming mm. from a place of real gratitude and you're thankful, it's a very different emotion than a lot of the negativity that we, we roll through our minds over and over again. Mm. And so I love the place that you mentioned. It could be something as simple as an ink pen and being grateful for that. Because of everything that you look at and you're aware consciously in the different moments that you are in throughout the day, I'm grateful for this and I'm so happy for this. I really enjoy this. It changes the way that you look at the world. And then the world around you starts changing because you are aware. And when you are aware, you have choices. It's like saying, um, did you notice the yellow car? And all of a sudden you start noticing the yellow car everywhere because now you are aware. And that gratitude is like honing in on a frequency that then wherever you look, what you see is more things to be grateful for. And I love that you shared this with us today because there are there are so many of us that just need that boost of a lesson. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. It is, it is a pleasure to be able to share that, you know. It, it is really, really, it, it fulfills my purpose and it makes me grateful to be able to do that. And I hope I can age for a long time. <laughs> I'm getting better at aging. <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, maybe in 20 years I can do still do the same thing because some people said when, when are you retiring I don't want to retire what's that that concept is foreign to me because I love what I do I don't want to retire I want to continue I want to get better at it I want to help more people well one of the the most important things that I think we take away from our time together today is that at a particular moment of your life there was a very deep, severe sadness and darkness. And as a result of going through that, you made a commitment to learn and to use those, those lessons to become a better person. And then you use those lessons to help other people. And I would like mm -hmm. to encourage whoever's joining us today, if you are having a moment or if at some point in your life you have a moment that is dark and discouraging, 
that you will remember Dr. Christine today and that she used her personal power to get through those dark moments in order that she could shine her light on the people that came after. So I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Angela. I, I couldn't have summarized that better myself. Actually, you did it better than I could have done it myself. Thank you. Well, thank you. Please tell our listeners where they can go to find you. Mm. Well, the easiest way is just Google me on the internet. You'll find me everywhere. My website is docchristine.com. Get the, send me an email. Uh, wherever you can find me, send me a message. I'll get to you and we'll get together somehow. And the first call is always free. On my website, there's a big purple button, schedule an appointment that's free and you can talk to me. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I will leave links in the show notes to this as well so you guys can access Dr. Christine again. And thanks again so much for joining us today. This was awesome. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Angela. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And for the rest of you guys, we will see you same time, same place next week. Thanks for joining us today. I'm delighted that you are here.